One claims it's the company's only chance for survival. Atari has filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. The 31 year old. EWA presents the difference. Kodak is filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. What's up guys, my name is Jake and welcome to the 15th episode of Bankrupt. There are a lot of cruise ships sailing from North American ports and owned by American companies. Those cruise lines make up some of the largest cruise ship fleets ever and all make up the massive multi-billion dollar industry it is. But only one of those modern ships is actually flagged as an American cruise ship. The rest are all registered in countries like the Bahamas and Panama, something which is known as the flag of convenience, all in an effort to skirt around labor wages and taxes. But that that one American flagship today is anything but normal, and has had a tumultuous past with bankruptcies, political scandals, a partial sinking, and a rather brief attempt at a domestically flagged cruise line. This is the story of the Pride of America and the failed cruise line meant to revolutionize passenger shipping in the US, NCL America. I want to quickly shout out my brand new channel, Bright Sun Travels, a place where I can discuss and review travel-related experiences in an unfiltered, context-driven form. Click the link in the description below or follow the card in the top right corner to subscribe. The story begins in 1993, not with Norwegian Cruise Line, but a newly formed corporation called American Classic Voyages. This new American-based cruise line would focus operations specifically around American flag ships, particularly river cruises, with their acquisition of the Delta Queen Steamboat Company. They also wanted to enter the Hawaiian cruise market, which turns out to be a little bit difficult. Two maritime laws make Hawaiian cruises a bit complicated, those being the Passenger Vessel Service Act of 1886 and the Merchant Marine Act of 1920. They stipulate that a foreign flagged vessel cannot transport passengers between US ports. This law, however, does not apply if either the embarkation port is outside of the country or if the ship stops in a foreign port while on its voyage. It's why most Alaskan cruises sail out of Vancouver, and if they don't, there's always a stop in Canada. It's also why there's no short cruises from, say, Los Angeles to San Diego and back. It's always cruises that start out of San Diego or Los Angeles and make a stop in Mexico. The same can be said for Hawaiian cruises. It's a lot of distance to cover, which means basically all cruises have to be from the mainland, which is typically around 10 to 15 days worth of a voyage. So most round trip or even one way Hawaii cruises either originate from Vancouver, Canada, or if they're sailing from an American port, they have to make a stop in Mexico. This is basically the only way traditional cruise ships, which are foreign flagged, can operate this type of itinerary. It's often very long sailings with a steep price to go along with it. In order to sail exclusively around the islands, however, the ship would have to be flagged as American since there are no foreign ports to stop at around the islands to get around this law. So getting back to American classic voyages, they began building out a fleet of older American-built ships and sailing them under the brand American Hawaii Cruises. They were older ocean liners and were actually built in the United States. So the company would be able to flag them domestically and staff them by Americans, allowing their ships to sail around the American island state without having to originate or stop at a foreign port. That was a big deal, and ACV was enjoying their basically uncontested market dominance in Hawaii. But the company had much grander ambitions for their future than just some aging former ocean liners. With support of Congress under the U.S. flag cruise ship pilot project statutes, American Classic Voyages had announced Project America in 1998. This came in the form of a letter of intent with the Mississippi shipyard in Gal's shipbuilding for up to three 72,000 ton cruise ships. With the support of congressmen from both Hawaii and Mississippi and over $360 million in federal loans to help construct the first two ships, the designs were finalized and construction actually began in 2000. With it expected to enter service in 2002 along with another set of smaller intercoastal vessels, American Classic Voyage Voyages, at least from the outside, appeared to have been the first American cruise line in decades to bring a major US flagged vessel to the market. That was, however, until 2001, when on October 19th, 
the company rather abruptly filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The corporation claimed this catastrophic fall was from the economic and tourism downturn following the events of September 11. But in reality, it was reported that the company was long in trouble, well over leveraged, and according to Jack Williams, a bankruptcy expert, quotes, so undercapitalized that they're vulnerable to such catastrophic events. American Classic Voyages was well into construction on Project America by this point, with materials already being ordered and shipped for their second vessel in the fleet. Their legacy ships were repossessed by the government as the company had failed to pay back several loans. The largest of which was that original $360 million, which was supposed to fund Project America, which ACV failed to pay back $220 million worth of it, effectively forcing the taxpayers to pay for the failed company and the partially built cruise ship. While the smaller, new-build intercoastal ships were sold off and eventually entered service in 2001, little was known what would actually happen to the remaining assets of the company, specifically with Project America. That was until one of the major U.S. cruise lines decided to step in. In August 2002, Norwegian Cruise Line announced they had purchased the 40% completed Project America vessel, as well as the materials for the second never-built ship. Norwegian also acquired the SS Independence from that government seizure, as it was still a valuable asset since it was American-made. So was the deteriorating SS United States, which they had also infamously purchased. Both of those ships were ultimately never put into service service, but at the time, it was a very clear indicator that Norwegian had big plans to continue where American Classic Voyages had left off. The unfinished Project America hull was eventually towed to Germany, where it would be lengthened and completed under the name Pride of America. It wasn't exactly without issue, though, as during the construction, the nearly completed ship partially sank after a heavy rainstorm. The water reached Deck 3, and the entire ship had a heavy list. A rocky start, sure. But Norwegian Cruise Line was now securing their future by petitioning Congress to allow special permission for their new ship to still fall under the guidelines of an American ship despite it being finished overseas. Ultimately, Norwegian got exactly what they asked for, along with permission to reflag another two ships which had no prior connection to the US in their construction. With the runway cleared for almost certain dominance of the ever-elusive Hawaii cruise markets, in 2003 the company announced their new subsidiary corporation called NCL America. The partial sinking of the Pride of America ultimately delayed things for their new fleet, since it was set to start off the new brand. Instead, the company decided to refurbish an existing ship, the Norwegian Sky, renaming it to the Pride of Aloha. After a celebratory entrance into Hawaii, the ship was renovated to reflect its coming itineraries and reflagged and re-registered now to America. Her companion ship, the Pride of America, wasn't far behind as the ship set sail for New York City for its christening in June 2005. It then made way for Hawaii too, becoming the first new US-flagged ocean-going cruise ship in nearly 50 years. With the Pride of Aloha, and the Pride of America sailing the waters of the Pacific, Norwegian was ready to fulfill the last planned U.S. flagship in the NCL America fleet. This one too was a new build from their jewel class of ships, and by its completion, the vessel cost over $500 million to build, which became the most expensive U.S. flagship ever. Originally, the vessel was planned to be the sister of the Pride of America, but the larger tonnage of the jewel class was ultimately decided upon. However, the materials intended for the second Project America ship were utilized for the construction of this ship. By early 2006, the Pride of Hawaii was launched, also intending to sail seven night voyages around the island. NCL America's fleet was now finished, and Norwegian Cruise Line was already feeling the effects of their new company, just not in the way they had hoped. With climbing fuel prices and local wage increases, the subsidiary was dragging the entire company underwater, with the first quarter of 2006 coming in with a loss of nearly $30 million. With each passing quarter, the company continued to lose tens of millions of dollars, with much of that being attributed to their Hawaii and NCL America operations. According to their 2006 year-end annual report, the company claimed that the unprecedented nature of their new venture gave little indication of how the market would actually react. 
This, after all, was the first time any company had attempted to do something like this. They also say, quote, We are currently experiencing losses on our Hawaii inter-island operations, and we cannot ensure that these cruises will ultimately be successful for us. New issues never faced before in the industry were also popping up. Since their ships were flying the Stars and Stripes, their entire crew also had to be American and follow the company's rather strict labor laws, at least in comparison to other flags of convenience. Initially, the reviews from passengers on the ships of the American crew were pretty bad, as they just weren't prepared. The turnover rate for that crew was extremely high, and forced Norwegian to raise wages even higher to keep people working. By early 2007, Norwegian was clearly in a panic, and decided to make some big changes as the pride of Hawaii was to be withdrawn the following year from the inter-island markets and reflagged to Nassau, Bahamas. In February 2008, the ship was renamed to the Norwegian Jade, repainted with a new livery, and sent out for European itineraries. But the interior of that ship hilariously remained the same. So, as the ship sailed the waters of the Mediterranean, the inside was themed to Hawaii. Pride of Aloha also received a similar treatment, as Norwegian pulled the plug on it too, renaming it back to the Norwegian sky, and also reflagging it to NASA. It left Hawaii in May 2008, and with it, the entire NCL America brand. The company had effectively given up on their venture, and now it just left the Pride of America as the last remnants of their multi-year experiment, which the company had invested so much into and spent so long lobbying the government to allow. Eventually, Eventually, Pride of America began to generate revenue and was left as it was, as a pretty strange outlier of the former brand. Today, it holds two titles. It's the world's only major US flagged cruise ship, and it also might be the world's ugliest cruise ship. Really though, it is a fascinating vessel, one that is incredibly rare in this ultra carefully planned industry. The ship was already half built when Norwegian took it over, and it was designed by an entirely different corporation, likely with entirely different designs philosophies. It's why it looks so vastly different than any other ship in their fleet. And it has an incredible story to tell, as it was partially built in America, then partially sunk in Germany, and here it is now, a very weird modern ship with a very American interior. I think the word gaudy would come to mind when touring this ship. I think it could benefit from an overhaul, maybe something a bit more centered around the Hawaiian culture. Really nothing about this ship is subtle, and just because because of its past, it is a very unique cruise ship. It's just so vastly different from the rest of the cruise line, even just in name only. Despite the brand it had been associated with now dead, the smokestack still proudly displays a logo which hasn't been used by the company in over 15 years. In the end, NCL America cost the company hundreds of millions, potentially even billions of dollars. In the way they had it structured, it was a total failure, and likely brought the entire company the closest it had ever gotten to declaring bankruptcy. The fact was, the Hawaii market just wasn't big enough for three different ships, all sailing extended itineraries, all of which didn't have much variation in length of sailings, and more or less called the same port. Other cruise lines still found pretty good success with their mainland to Hawaii cruises, which put even more pressure on Norwegian's struggling ticket sales. Even when passengers were aboard, their spending tended lower than other ships since they weren't allowed to have casinos on board. Employing Americans also meant margins were much tighter, which caused ticket prices to nearly double compared to other places like the Caribbean. Just four years into operation, the company had no choice but to cut their losses and reduce their fleet size. Looking back, it's just astonishing the toll it took on these companies just to get these ships built to skirt around a US law enacted over a century ago. Remember, in the end, this was all about having the ability to sail cruises around the islands of Hawaii without having to return to the mainland or make additional stops. It's kind of insane that the very thing they had been fighting for years on and spending millions and millions of dollars to try and achieve wasn't even a feasible business plan. And and didn't even work out for them. It actually ended up hindering the company in a rather large way. Norwegian built two brand new ships for this market, renovated a third, and let's not forget they also purchased the SS Constitution and the SS United States, which they didn't even bother putting into service. But with the dust now settled, the future may finally seem rather smooth for the Pride of America as she continues to sail the waters of the Pacific. 
now as we think back, some may look at it as a modern day industry achievement, while others may see it as one of the most spectacular cruise line failures in history. Recently, I sailed aboard the Disney Fantasy, quite a difference between it and the Pride of America, especially in cabins. I really don't know what they were thinking with this suite before the ship's renovation. In very stark contrast, I got a chance to stay in a concierge room on the Fantasy, and along with a tour of our quite beautiful cabin, I've also made a review of my experience in Disney's upscale class of cabins, and if it's worth the money. This is all on my new channel, Bright Sun Travels, a place where I can structure high-quality reviews about experiences I like or don't like, all through the context of if it's worth your money. Very much like my video review of the Disney Wish here on this channel. I also have a review of my pretty awful stay at Disney's Contemporary Resort Club level, which will be coming very soon. If that's something that interests you, check out the channel in the top right hand corner or in the description below. And if you have any ideas of what you'd like to hear my thoughts on and review, let me know in the comments below. It might just have to be the Pride of America, although I'm not sure how a Canadian like me would fare aboard that ship. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.